So, we're doing hypothesis testing. This is the fundamentals of hypothesis testing. <coughs> testing, we have a population <coughs> we care about. We have a parameter that we care about. Let's say, for example, the average of something, the average age, the average weight, the average income, something you can make a statement about. If I believe the average income in New York City is $40,000 a year. So let's test it. Take a bunch of people, see how much they make. But we, have, we start out with a, 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 a statement. And the population we're going to use in this example is the random number table. The average, which of course we know if it's a good random number table, which goes between 0 and 9, should be 4.5. We're also going to assume for the first set of calculations that we know the sigma, which is really unrealistic. In most real life examples, if you don't know the population, and you don't know the, a and you don't know the average, I put a question mark here, then you don't know the sigma. So this is usually not available, but to make it a little bit simple, we'll make it a little bit, let's make believe we know one of the two important numbers namely the sigma. Later on, we'll, do, we'll work it out so we don't know either of the two numbers and we have to change the formula slightly. So this can be expressed using the hypothesis testing uh, terminology as the null hypothesis, h sub 0, the average is truly 4.5, which in everyday English would be the random number table is good. <coughs> random numbers are okay. And the h1 claims the average is not 4.5, namely the exact opposite of this, the random number table is not okay. I really shouldn't say the table because we're, really, we're also testing at the same time we're testing Excel. Because Excel generates random numbers. We can say, does, gener does Excel generate a correct bunch of random numbers so the average is truly 4.5 or is it not? So that's another one. We're really testing either the books table or the random number table generator, the random number generator from Excel. So the logical thing to do in this case is to take a sample from the population and calculate, get those numbers, whatever they happen to be, calculate the average of the sample, and if the sample is close to 4.5, we're going to say, you know what, we're giving, since we're giving the benefit of the doubt to the 8-0, then the 8-0 mm -hmm. guy is telling me everything is okay, that's no problem here. And since in real life you never exactly get the average of the sample exactly perfectly equal to 4.5, that's too much to expect. So if it's close to 4.5, then we're going to accept the 8-0, but if it's far from 4.5, then we're going to accept the H1 or reject the 8-0, it's technically. So the only question we have to talk about is how close does it have to be? 4.6, well that's pretty close. 4.7 is also pretty close, etc. And that's what, that's what the homework for today was to come up with a, a intuitive or heuristic or informal way of just coming up with how close do you think the X bar of your sample has to be to the ideal number. Now it depends upon the sample size, because if I took a sample of 5,000, if you took 5,000 random numbers, you expect this average to be very, very, very close to 4.5 if the average is truly 4.5. If the population, if the random number table is generating perfectly typical random numbers, and you take 5,000 of them, you're pretty sure the average will come out like 4.55, 4.56, 4.57, something pretty close to 4.5. On the other hand, if your sample is very small, like you took for the for this dinner assignment to prepare for this day, uh, if the sample size is just five, then if you get a, a 4.8 or, or 5.2, it's also considered relatively close. So it really depends, if this decision depends upon the sample size. It depends upon the sigma, because if these numbers are all over the place, sigma refers to the population spread. And when we have a population that goes from zero to nine, we quantify that as a sigma of 2.87. If the numbers were even more, since even more variable, then the X bars will also be more variable, in which case you'd have to give yourself even more leeway. So the amount of leeway depends upon the sample size, it depends upon the sigma, and finally, it depends upon something which we, you know from stat one, which I didn't mention yet, it depends upon, well, how close do you want it to be? I mean, how, how precise do you want to be? Do you want to be very accurate, a little bit accurate? You know, they want, how, how much of a mistake do you want to make? In other words, if you say, if you make the decision, well, if it's within 4.6 or 4.4, if it's that close, to, if that's your decision, if that's your, the rule that you make, you set for yourself. Well, then there'll be many, many times when you're going to end up with a perfectly good table, but an average of 4.7 or 4.8 or 4.9 or 5.2 or 5.4. That's going to say reject that table, reject that table, reject that table, which means you're coming to a, a wrong decision. So, so, so the decision, the, the, act, the final boundary depends upon the sample size, the sigma, 
and how accurate you want to be. If you want to be very, very accurate, then you have to make one kind of rule. So we'll talk about, but if you try to be accurate in one direction, as we'll learn later on, there's something called type one error and type two error, you're going to mess up the other side. So you've got to sort of balance a bunch of things here to come up with the, I wouldn't say the perfect, there is no perfect rule, because everything is a balance between the opposite, opposite, uh, opposite criteria. But, so anyway, so you get a sample size, and we said last time in class that if you got a 4.6, First, a couple of people, I think it was Alger and a couple of other people, said, well, 4.6 is not 4.5, and therefore the answer should be the H1. I think it was, was it you? Yeah. Right. And then a couple, maybe you, you also, I think John said the same thing, and maybe, maybe not, but, but, but four, then we talked about it, and we said, you know, 4.6, if you take a perfectly good tape, an odd table, and you start pulling five numbers out of it, and you look at the average, you're never going to get exactly 4.5. If you get 4.6, it's about as best you're going to hope to get. In fact, the experience of that is based on the, on the experience of the, the spinner. So with 4.6, everybody, after a discussion, said I, that, that proves the A0 is right, or at least it proves that it's wrong. What about 4.4? Well, 4.4 is equally close, so it's the same thing. What about 4.7? Also pretty close to 4.5. What about 4.8? Also pretty close to 4.5, especially if you take the time to look at your spinner assignment. Spinner assignment 11, I think it was, where you were supposed to generate these averages based on a sample of five numbers coming from a presumably good table. And with the numbers you get are 4.8 and 6.2 and 3.4 and 3.6 and 4.2. These are the typical numbers you're getting. And 4.6 is you know, sort of right in the middle of all those numbers. It's not considered a, a, a ridiculously number. So 4.6, everybody agreed. Even 4.8, everybody agreed, belongs to the 8 zero. What about 5.0? What about 5.2? What about 5.4? What about 8.8? What if your average came out to 8.8? 8? Well, everybody who's been thinking about this and been doing the spinner or something realize you never get an 8.8, 8, even though theoretically it's possible. That's probably evidence of some kind that the table that we're pulling numbers from is probably an unusual table. Because if you never get an 8.8, 8, and you actually found an 8.8, 8, that's something strange is going on. So 8.8, 8, everybody who's been paying attention on Friday said we, belong, we believe the H1. The only question is, at which point do you change your vote? Do you change your vote at 5? Because at some point, you've got to switch over. Here, I believe the H, the 8, 0. 5.0, maybe I still believe the 8, 0. 8.6, I still believe the H, 1. 8.4, I still believe the H, 1. At some point, you're supposed to switch over your vote. If you just think about it logically, it's got to be a switchover. So that was the, that was the homework for today. Spinner assignment, what, what was that, 17? Spinner assignment number 7, 16, was to come up with that boundary. So I was actually thinking of asking the class to hand in their boundaries to see how many people are taking the homework seriously. Not so much, you know, I don't take any points off if you don't do homework, but I would like to correlate that with the results on the first test. If the people who hand in the homework today all get 90s, and the people who don't hand it and go get 30s and 40s, I'll be proving my point very dramatically, but I'm not going to waste everybody's time to do that. Anyway, so who did the homework? Anybody have a boundary? I see one hand up. Okay, Gene, well, you had me last year, so let's try somebody new. Yes? I picked, um, I didn't print it out, but I did it. I print, I picked, Nothing to print out, just picking a number. I picked that it was going to be um, 3.5 and 5.5. Fine, okay, that's a reasonable number. Well, at least it's, a, it's an answer to my question. You're saying 5.5 is the boundary. So let's put it down over here. Your name is Sarah, Sarah right? Yeah. And you're going to take out your name right before I forget it again. So Sarah's boundary, we'll call Sarah's boundary, was 3.5 to 5.5 is believing the 8.0. But if you go past 5.5, she would say, you know what, that's a little bit far from my ideal number. I'm going to believe the H1. So the basic structure everybody should agree with or understand, but the only question you can quibble about, maybe you want, you want to pick 2.5 and 6.5. I'm sure some people are thinking, that, well, Gina, what do you think? Yeah, we actually think the same thing, 3.5, 5.5, then 7. Okay, so, so we have a couple. So, so let's spend the next 10 minutes analyzing if Sarah and Gina's and whoever else quoted these numbers uh, Pick a reasonable pair of numbers, because again, there's no perfect answers. The only question is what's, what's reasonable versus what. Do you have any questions, by the way? Would you care if I write on the back? Yes. I got a boundary. It's the right yours. Two and seven. Yeah, because you remember from last year. You remember two <laughs> okay. So let anybody, anybody else have another boundary who did this homework, um, you know, so to speak, from scratch? Anybody else have another pair of numbers? <coughs> okay. All right. So I guess I'm on camera, so I'm, I'm not going to rant as much as I usually rant. I'm on camera, so. <laughs> okay. Um, because again, you know, okay. So the point is, the point is, the point is, the 
point is, that you understand the, the import of this question. You understand how, and if you would have done the homework, now, now again, what's the best way to do this? Of course, if you do the formula from stat one, or you relearn the formula, you plug it in, you come up with the perfect boundary. Or another way of coming up with